Good morning, Cornerstone Church. I'm Pastor Jake, and it is great to see you through this screen today. If you're a guest with us today, would you please go to www.bethalto.church and check in under the I'm New Here tab. And if you are a regular attender and you are online, please make sure that you uh, sign your name on the live stream chat. We have three ways to give here at Cornerstone. If you're here in service, you can drop it in the box in the foyer. If you are online, click the Give button to give online, or you can mail it to Cornerstone Church, 196 South Moreland Road, Bethalto, Illinois, 62010. Also on the live stream, there is a button down at the bottom that says Prayer. And if you need prayer for anything at all, please click that button, and we would be happy to join with you in prayer. And finally, if you have a K-5 through student, we are going to be doing a virtual Bible school, also known as VBS which is awesome because it works alongside Vacation Bible School, also known as BBS. It is going to be taking place between July 6th and July 10th, and it will be for any incoming kindergartners and any outgoing fifth graders. If you would like to sign your kid up, please mark going on the event on Facebook online. Each child that signs up will be assigned a team color and they will have a home kit that will be labeled with their name, which will be available for pickup here at the church July 1st. Every day, they will watch the VBS video and participate at home, earning points for their team by doing activities around the house, helping out with chores, and every and by Friday, all the points are going to be tabulated and a winner is going to be announced live at 9 a.m. All children from the winning team are going to be getting a visit with a prize drop-off. This sounds like a lot of fun, and I don't think I can do it. Like, I'm not old, too young, I'm not young enough, but I would if I could. So if you have a kid that age, you should definitely sign them up. Here comes the service. Share the link. Right here. Well, good morning, Cornerstone. Thanks for being here today, each and every one of you that's here in person with us, and thank you to all of you who are watching online. I'm excited about what the Lord is doing in us and among us and through us, and so we are going to celebrate today, we're going to worship, and we're going to hear from God's Word. So I'm going to open up with a word of prayer. If you don't mind, if you're able, would you stand with us as we sing, and if you're home, Stand, sit on the couch. I don't know what you're doing, but find your posture for worship and let's celebrate today. God, we lift you up. Lord, we recognize that you are our hope and you are our strength. And Lord, now as we take a few moments to sing to you, God, we pray that you would help us to connect with you in a meaningful way. Jesus, we pray that our spirit would connect with you and that you would challenge us and change us. Lord, as we look at your word, God, may it sear our hearts where we need to be uh, changed and challenged. But ultimately, God, make us more like you, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Worship team, will you lead us, please?
spirit lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Praising you that, God, I am yours and you are mine, and I can rest in you, Lord. Whatever trial we face, God, we just embrace your presence in our lives, Lord. Be with us today. Let us feel your love. Let us feel your comfort, and let us feel your presence today in this house. Amen. Amen. Thanks, worship team, for leading us. If you want to take a seat, I want to welcome you again today to Cornerstone. So appreciate our our, our teams that help us pull this off every week. We've got a great worship team that helps us, and we've got uh, a, a great tech team as well that keep us uh, online and get the sound out and make sure the lights are all running the way they should. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching us online, I just want to remind you, if you are watching us online and you just checked in, feel free to, or you just got on, feel free to check in. Uh, just drop your name in the chat there. Let us know that you're here. Uh, you can give online, or if you're here, you can give in the uh, offering receptacle. Uh, it's not really a bucket. I don't know what we call that. Offering receptacle out in the uh, foyer there. So uh, with that said, um, you know, when I graduated high school and moved on to college, uh, there was a different, uh, significantly different learning environment that I experienced from high school into college. Now, I went to, I think, a pretty good uh, high, uh, high school. I had overall really good teachers. Uh, there was a few that uh, we could maybe have another conversation about. But, um, but by and large, most of my teachers were invested in my education uh, and, and the students. They would, they would speak to us about uh, upcoming assignments and keep us informed on what we needed to do to get projects done and timelines. But I found that when I went to college, it was a little bit of a different expectation because at the beginning of the semester, I was given a syllabus. And now some teachers would kind of talk about those things along the way, but I had some professors that it was like, hey, everything you need to know about, about exams and about books that you need to read and about assignments and papers that are due, it's all in there. My job here is to teach. It's your job to keep track of those details. And that's how they approached it. 
Uh, you know, in high school, they maybe would say, you know, get your outline done by this date, write your introduction now, and then, but in, but in college, it was like, no, the whole thing's due on this day. That's just how they handled it. Uh, in fact, I had one um, teacher, I, I went on from college, I went in and got a master's degree, and I had a professor there, uh, wonderful guy, Gary McGee, who's passed away now, um, one of my one of the best teachers I had uh, just all throughout my educational experience. And he, he gave us our, his syllabus at the beginning of the semester, and then he included another sheet of paper with it. And he said, uh, one of the things that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to write some longer papers. And I'm very particular about how I want papers written. And so this sheet is an outline of all the different things that I want you to do on and what I don't want you to do on your papers that you turn in for me. Well, he was notorious for being very stingy with giving out A's on his papers. And I remember um, maybe midway through the semester, or it might have even been the second class that I had with him, I, I, I made it my mission I was going to get an A on one of those papers. And so I got my paper done a little early, a couple days or a week or something, and I took that sheet of paper out that he gave us that he only mentioned on the first day of class. And I went through point by point, line by line, and I made sure that I did all the grammar things he wanted me to do, all the sentence structure things that I needed to do, and I got an A. So, but I say that not to brag about the A, although people that took classes with him, they're always very impressed. Like, oh, you got an A from him. Wow, that's very nice. But it was because I, I followed that sheet. Now, my point is just simply to say that, you know, in grade school, and then in junior high, and then in the high school, and then into college, and then masters, and then if you go on beyond that, there are different levels of expectations. And how your instructors will teach you and, and interact with you are based on those expectations. Like, you're at this level, you should be able to do this on your own. Well, in the same way, or very similar to that, in our text today, what we're going to see is we're going to see that uh, this is true, yes, of education, but it's also true of our relationship with Jesus. Uh, we're in a series of messages called Jesus Is. Uh, we're looking at Matthew chapter 10 and chapter 11. And throughout these two chapters, we get a, several different portraits of who Jesus is. And oftentimes, uh, we are our expectations of what Jesus should be saying or doing or reacting. Uh, what we'll find in Matthew chapter 10 and 11 is that those expect expectations are challenged of us. And here today, what we see is we see the greater revelation that we have means the greater the accountability that we also have. So, in other words, you could say it this way, the more we know, the more responsibility uh, we are, or the more, the more we are responsible for. So let's look at our text, verse 20. It says this, Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed, because they did not repent. Now, last week leading up to this, we saw a bit of a shift in Jesus' tone, uh, he began to kind of criticize the people of his day. If you remember, he says, what is this generation like? And he gives us this parable or this word picture, and he basically says, this generation is, is like a bunch of spoiled kids who are arguing and refusing to engage in the games that are happening on the playground, is basically what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, uh, this generation, it's this tone, this, this is shifting here, and we're going to see this continue to shift and increase uh, in our text here today. Jesus, it says, he began to denounce. Now, that's a, that's a pretty strong word in English, but in Greek, it is, I would argue, even a stronger word. In this context, it means to reprimand, criticize, or to blame someone. And this Greek word that's translated denounce here, in other contexts, it can be even more of a harsh uh, interaction with two people. So it's important for us to recognize that as Jesus is now talking and he's beginning to denounce these towns, we need to recognize that he is denouncing, he's doing this as an insider, not as an outsider. So I think, I think most of you are aware that my family and I, we moved down here from the Chicagoland area about or just over 10 years ago. And I'm always very careful of how I say that. I say I moved from the Chicagoland area because uh, we are not from the city. I think people, when they hear Chicago, they just assume that you're like downtown in the city or something. But, but actually, where I grew up uh, is about 17 miles farther away from Chicago than Bethalto is from St. Louis. So I was about 47 miles away from the city. We we're about 30. So that just gives you a little context distance-wise. But nonetheless, um, you know, when we moved down here, uh, things were just a little bit different. The culture is different. The pace of life is a little different. The way people think, 
uh, some of the things that people value and the way that people conduct their lives and they interact. It's just, it's just different. And so it took us a while to adapt and to get used to those differences. Now, I'll, I'll just share one of those things that still to this day, um, and, and, I, and I see this almost daily, and it just, I don't understand it. And it's, none of these things are good or, or bad or right or wrong. They're just different, okay? Uh, but uh, one of the things that I, it's just fascinating to me is, is, the, is the hit and run and the drive-through thing that happens. When people drive up, like, is like, and so, like, I have family and friends that, not so much anymore, because they've kind of been down here now, but when they first, when we first moved down, they would visit, and we'd be driving by a hit and run, and they'd be like, what's, what's going on over there? And I was like, oh, they're just at the hit and run getting a humdinger. And they're like, are you speaking another language? What are you talking about? Like, the, the drive-through gas station thing just fascinates me. Again, not a right or wrong thing. I'm not trying to be judgy. But even me telling that story today, you know, look, I've been here over 10 years, over a decade, but I still know that in many people's minds, I'm still an outsider in some ways to some people. And so even me telling that story, I got to think, like, are people going to get upset with me because I'm talking about, you know, the, the hit and run or something? I don't know. Maybe you love that. I'm not, sorry if I offended you. But, but, but Jesus doesn't have to worry about that here. Because Jesus isn't talking about uh, these, these towns as though he were an outsider. He's talking to them as though he were an insider. Because these towns that Jesus is addressing and he's denouncing or criticizing, these are all places that he was very, very familiar with. They were near where he grew up. In fact, one of the towns was about an hour, uh, hour's walk away, which, have been, which would have been very close. Um, he visited these towns probably very regularly. These were his childhood neighbors uh, and friends. Th- these were the bakers where he and his family would go and get their bread. It was perhaps one of these towns over where there was a tailor where they would go get their clothes made or fixed. Uh, you know, we, we often say that Joseph, uh, Jesus' father, was a, a carpenter. Some scholars think he was actually a stonemason, but regardless of that, whatever work they did, it's very possible that uh, they did work for people in these other communities. But on top of that, these other towns that Jesus is denouncing here, on top of that, these are locations where Jesus had been doing ministry in. They had experienced his powerful acts, and they had heard his teaching. They had benefited from Jesus being there. And Jesus, we're told, denounces them, and and we're given a reason why. The last part of the verse says, because they did not repent. It wasn't because they didn't receive Jesus' ministry, because as we said, he did several miracles there. He taught there. The people uh, heard his teaching. They experienced his work. And it's not because they didn't believe, because presumably they did. That's why those things took place there. And it's not because they were opposed to him. We don't have any sense of violence or antagonism against him. But the issue wasn't any of those things. The issue was that they were unchanged. There, there's no indication that they were, you know, violent towards him or refusing him, but they were indifferent to what he had done among them. You see, church, they had received, but they hadn't repented. And they had been challenged, but they hadn't been changed. And what we're going to see in the next couple of verses here amounts to what is some of the sharpest and the strongest criticism that Jesus gives. And remember, as Jesus gives this criticism, he's doing this as an insider to other insiders. He's not talking to pagans. He's not talking to people who haven't experienced his work. These are his own people. So what does Jesus say? Verse 21, he says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Now, when we uh, see that word woe, uh, some of us, we may have, like sometimes when I've read this, I think of like an expression of anger or maybe vengeance or that kind of thing. And there may be a touch of a tone of that in here in these words, but it's actually more than that. This is an expression of regret and lament for someone's situation. Uh, some other translations of the Bible use the word alas. Oh, alas. And that's kind of the way it's communicating. Or or other translations say, how terrible will it be for you? That's kind of the idea that's being communicated here. Have have you ever been, you know, scrolling through, uh, you know, Facebook or something, and you get across one of those videos where it's one of those uh, videos where people are like a a falling or tripping or like... Like, an, like I, I, don't, I want to call it like an injury video, but like somebody's skateboarding and then they fall on their face, you know, or they're trying to do a trick on a bike or just, you know, I'm talking about those videos and it's just like a compilation of people wiping out. 
Yeah, I don't like watching those videos because like there's something like in physically that I experience when I see that. And a lot of times when I'm watching it, I'm like as the guy's like on the skateboard and he's going towards the stairs and he's going to jump off, I know what's going to happen. And I'm like yelling at my phone, no, no, don't do it. That's kind of what's happening here. Whoa, no, alas, how terrible will it be for you? That's the idea is anticipating what's happening. It's a, it's a warning kind of combined with compassion. It's a, a a mixture of doom and pity. And it follows the pattern that the prophets used when the prophets would speak out. Prophets like Isaiah. The second part of verse 21 continues. It says, woe to you to these towns. Uh, and it says this, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Now, we're a bit distant from the first century when these towns were being talked about, so let's get a little bit of context of what we're talking about here. Jesus has mentioned four towns or cities now. Two of them, let's call good towns. These are Jewish towns. These are the people that Jesus grew up around. These are the people that Jesus ministered in. These are the people that we would expect would be followers of him and approving Jesus. These other two towns, the second two that have been mentioned, Tyre and Sidon, these are the bad towns. These are the wicked towns. In fact, in the Old Testament, the prophets often spoke against these towns and prophesied judgment against these towns. Uh, Tyre, in particular, was known for being uh, arrogantly opposed to God and his people. And so you would expect with these four different towns, you would expect Jesus to praise these first two towns, and say, look, I did some great work among you. Thanks for letting me do that there. You received me or whatever. But instead, he doesn't praise them. But instead, what does he do? He, he criticizes them. He, he, he denounces them. He tells them that there's a problem here. The problem is that these two pagan cities, they would have repented if I did the things that I did for you here. If I had done those over here, they would have repented. And, and Jesus is essentially saying, you didn't repent. You didn't respond. He says not only would they repent, he goes, they would do it in sackcloth and in ashes, which was a very uh, public way for people to express their mourning and their sorrow for what they had done. So in other words, Jesus is saying that these people would have been moved to the core, but you are indifferent and seemingly there has been no change in you at all. And what's fascinating to me about this text is that Jesus is saying that he has contingent knowledge. He's, he's, saying, he's, he's not saying that Tyre and Sidon repented. They didn't. He didn't do his ministry there. He, he, he didn't give them that opportunity at this point. He's just saying that they would have. He knows what they would have done. He's saying, I did it for you and you didn't repent. And then the result then is found in verse 22. He says, but I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. Now, you know, um, you know I don't hear this expression uh, much more uh, today, but, you know, I know that there were times when, when I was a kid and I was giving my mom a hard time, uh, she would say to me, go to your room and wait until your dad gets home. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, that was like, uh-oh, we just leveled up here. <laughs> I am really in trouble right now. And in a sense, Jesus is saying, wait until judgment comes. He says, you're, you think that because I ministered among you that you're great and you've got this going for you, but think again, he says. Think again. Jesus gives us a sobering warning here. God's judgment takes into account opportunity and understanding. God's judgment takes into account the opportunities we've been given and the understanding that we have. Uh, recently, I've been digitizing some of our old uh, tapes, and I've been uh, putting them on our computer. And so I found uh, this old video of Parker when he was just a little guy in a high chair learning to eat. And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing because by the end of the meal, I mean, it's like he's eating like macaroni or something, and he's got like pasta sauce all over his hair. It's like a noodle in his nose and just a mess all over the place. I like think he's got like stuff on the back of his hand, you know. And then, of course, he gets excited and he hits the table and the sauce is splatting everywhere. You know, it's one of those things. Look, we did not punish him for making a mess. Like, we didn't ground him. Go to your room. Crawl faster, you know, get to your room. Like, we didn't do that, okay? But, like, today, if we go home and we eat and Parker's got, you know, food in his hair and stuff all over the place, that's a totally different conversation, isn't it? Why? 
because there's a different set of accountability that a child, ha- like a baby has, versus a teenager. There's a different level of expectations that we have. There's more life experience. There's more practice. All of those different things. That, that's what God does for us in His judgment. It takes into, he takes into account the opportunities that we have and the understanding that we have. You see, God is judge, but He is also just. He's also just and He's good. Luke, 24, uh, Luke 12, 48 says that, uh, Jesus says, to whom much is given, much is required. Oftentimes we look at that verse in terms of like the blessings that we have or the material things that we have and how we can use those things. But he's talking about the opportunities that we have, to, that we've been given and the knowledge that we have. Now, what Jesus does, he's given us these uh, example of these four cities. Jesus is now going to give us kind of the same, uh, kind of an example again, but he's going to use two cities, one that is more extreme on each side. He says this in verse 23, and you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Now, Capernaum was Jesus's base for ministry. In Matthew chapter 4, we read that Jesus, in a sense, moved there. He made that his hometown. He lived there. He did his ministry out of that. In fact, as we were looking throughout Matthew so far, we've seen Jesus perform several different miracles in, in this area, in this city in particular. So this city has been the focus of his work and his teaching. And on the one hand, this is a blessing for this town. But on the other hand, Jesus has some harsh words for them. In this verse here, Jesus is using the language that the prophet Isaiah used in one of his prophecies. Now, one of the things that Isaiah did is he prophesied against some of the wicked nations of his day. And in Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah prophesies against the, the city of, and the people of Babylon, which is one of the most wicked nations, uh, certainly um, in the scriptures. Uh, there's another one that we'll get to in a second here. But Babylon was known for its wickedness. It was a, a tool that God used for his judgment. And th- this is what Isaiah writes. Babylon said, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High, end quote. And then the God, through the prophet, says this. But you, Babylon, are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of of the pit. So, so Jesus is taking the language that the prophet Isaiah used, and now he's using it to Capernaum, this place where he's done all this ministry and work in. And basically what Jesus is saying is he's suggesting that the prideful attitude of Babylon is the same prideful attitude that Capernaum has. The prophet pronounced judgment on Babylon, and Jesus is now making that same, same statement of judgment against Capernaum. Uh, They were arrogant, and they thought that they were blessed. They thought that they were lifted up. Maybe some people in that town thought, look, there's this man. He's doing all these miracles. Perhaps he's the Messiah. Of course he would do that here in Capernaum, and we 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 are proud. We are lifted up in what we're saying, and Jesus says, are you really lifted up? No. He says, in fact, you will go down to Hades, which is the place of death and judgment. He continues on, and he says, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. So if it was intense that Jesus was uh, comparing them to Babylon, it's even more intense, it's even worse now that he's comparing them to Sodom. Tyre and Sodom, or Tyre and Sidon were bad enough, but, but Sodom is the epitome of wickedness. Verse 24, it says this, but I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Now, the Jewish people in those days, they anticipated this one kind of final day of judgment at the end of time that, where everything would be made right. And even though the city of Sodom had been destroyed a long time ago, they expected that the, that the people of that city would be judged in this end day. And that's what Jesus is referring to here. So S- Sodom is viewed as like the worst of the worst of the worst all throughout scriptures. And on the day of judgment, everybody knew Sodom was the first in line. Everybody knew that Sodom was bad. But Jesus says, you know what? You think Sodom is first in line, but Capernaum, you're actually there in front of them. He says, this, is, this, this city that has experienced the, this ministry of mine and you've benefited from my presence, Jesus says, you're going to be worse off than even Sodom on the day of judgment. You see, church, the greater the revelation, the greater the accountability. The cities that Jesus was denouncing were not being denounced because of their defiance of him, but because of their indifference to him. 
You know, church, we're a blessed people, and we all know that the world is a little bit crazy now. But even in the midst of that, we do have remarkable freedoms. We have, and I know it's a little different the way we're, we're gathering. Many of you are watching online. We've got, several, we've got a lot of people here today. But we do have the freedom to worship. We do have the freedom to gather together. And, and you know what? We, many of us are blessed in that we've been in church for many, many years, perhaps even maybe most of our lives. Right now, at this point in history, we have more access to God's Word in more ways than at any other point in the history of our world. We have more access to Bible teachers and books and worship music and any number of other aids to our faith. But church, if we are not careful, we're going to end up just like these cities that Jesus was speaking to in our text today. Matt Woodley uh, is a is a, a, a scholar and a, an author, and he wrote this, and I just think this summarizes it so well for us. He says, Jesus' judgments and threats always start with the most spiritually advanced people, the people who know much but practice little. He doesn't warn those who need conversion. He warns those who think they already have it. And, and, and when you look at the life of Jesus, you see the, the strongest things that he says are always to the spiritual, always to the ones who are on the inside, always to the ones who should know better and have it all together. And church, I've been struck by this passage over the last couple of weeks as I've been studying, as I've been praying, as I've been planning and preparing for this. Church, I, re- I believe that this passage here, this message here for us today is a reminder and it's a warning for us because, church, the reality is, is for most of us in this room, most of us know much. And the question we have to ask ourselves are, are we practicing much or are we practicing little? The main question or main concern, rather, that Jesus has at the beginning of this text is that the people had not repented. They, they, you know, Jesus isn't looking for like, Uh, amazement and admiration. He's looking for a broken and a contrite heart. He's looking for people who will repent and acknowledge the error of their ways and turn to him and make make him Savior and Lord and King. You see, remember, Jesus isn't warning those who need conversion. He's warning those who think they already have it. Another scholar, Dale Bruner, puts it this way. He says, Christian countries are in special trouble on the judgment day. Not because Jesus has not really been in their communities, but because he has. And church, we need to take Jesus seriously. Our faith is more than just receiving. It's repenting. Our faith is more than just being challenged. It's being changed and changing ourselves and our lives. And so our response today is is simply repent. Our, our response today is to repent. And I, as I was thinking about this and, and, and looking at our text, there's, I think, three different areas that we as a church right now today that we need to respond in repentance in. And the first is in regards to sin. Church, we need to be people that are constantly and regularly confessing our sin and acknowledging the ways that we have said, God, I'd rather be God of my life right now. Not, not thy will be done, but my will be done. Anytime any of us have done that, what we've done is we've, we've made ourselves into rebels against the king and, the, and, his, and his will and his way, and we've sinned and we've erred. And church, we need to constantly look at our lives and say, what is there in our hearts? And that goes from the person who's here, uh, who's been here the least amount of time to the person who's been here the longest. It, it goes from the person who is, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, you know, the, the most of an outsider to the person like myself. I need to do this for myself as well. I need to repent of my sin. I need to repent of the things that have caused me to have a separation in my relationship with God. And if you're watching today, or if you're here in the room, and you need to make a decision to follow after Jesus, I want to encourage you to do that. It's, it's, it's as simple as saying a prayer and saying, Jesus, I'm sorry for what I've done to be the king or the ruler or the God of my own life. Will you forgive me of my sins? I want to give myself to you. If you're here, you can get onto our digital bulletin at bethalto.church and you can respond and let us know that you're making that decision. We'd love to pray with you and connect with you. If you're watching online, there should be a button that comes up about following Jesus. You can click on that if you want to determine to make him your Savior and Lord. But we need to be people that repent, not just at one point in our lives, but constantly. And the second area that we need to repent is our indifference. 
What happens so often for many, many believers is our hearts grow cold. And indifference comes when things just become good enough. When it's just like, you know what, uh, uh, you know, attending church or experiencing this or doing that, it's just good enough for my faith. And we lose that drive, we lose that heart, and we become, quite honestly, like Capernaum and these other cities where, hey, we had a great experience, but that's it, and we're going to leave it there. The other area that we need to repent of is our inaction. Inaction occurs, I think, when we live off of our past experiences. Because the reality is, is that many of us have done some things for God. But what happens is if we're not careful, that thing that we did last week, then all of a sudden it becomes two weeks ago since we really did something for God. And then it becomes a month ago. And then it becomes a year. And then it becomes a decade or more. And then we just live off of that. And we think, well, I did something then. But no, church, we are called to be active in our faith and alive in it. What does it look like for us to live out and to be active in our faith? We, we go back to Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to know what it looks like to live out the kingdom, it, it will take you a lifetime to get all of that integrated into your life. Make that a part of your study on a regular basis, the Sermon on the Mount, and then move to the Sermon on Mission in, in Matthew chapter 10 about going out and making a difference. Church, this is what we're called to. We need to repent, church, of of our sin. We need to repent of our uh, indifference, and we need to repent of our inaction. Because, church, at some point in time, Jesus is going to come. And, And my prayer is that he wouldn't look at Cornerstone and say, woe to you, Cornerstone. But he would say, well done, Cornerstone, in what you've done. I don't want Jesus to look at my life at the end and say, you know what, man, I did some great things in you, but then, you know, you you stopped repenting of the sin. You stopped allowing me to refine you and make you more like me. I I don't want Jesus to to look at my life and say, man, we had a great experience there, but then you just kind of became indifferent for me, and you kind of just, just, just were accepting the status quo. And you just kind of let life kind of go by, and you kind of tried to ride out that prayer or that experience that you had back there. I don't want Jesus to look at my life and say, wow, you know, you did some great things, you preached some good messages, but then nothing else ever happened. There was inactivity that happened on your personal life and the people around you. Church, I don't want Jesus to say woe to me. I don't want Jesus to say woe to you. And so the answer that's really clear in our text, the reason why he said the woes was because they didn't repent. So church, let's be people that repent. Let's be people that say, Jesus, would you forgive me? Jesus, would you ignite a passion in my heart? And Jesus, would you fill me with your spirit so I can go out and boldly do the work that you've called me to do? Let's pray. God, today, as we take a few moments here at the end to just worship you, God, it is, it is, a, it is a humbling thing for us to th- consider these towns that were, that were part of Jesus' hometown, his, his neighbors, People that received the ministry, these Jewish people that that should have been on the inside, they found themselves on the outside of Jesus' words here. Father, I pray that we would not be like them. God, help our hearts not to go cold and indifferent to you. Help us not to become complacent and stagnant and inactive in our relationship with you. Help us not ever think that we've arrived or that we're good enough, but but God, help us to continue to repent of our sin and to repent of our indifference and to repent of our inaction so that the words that we receive are not woe to you, but they would be well done, good and faithful servant. Jesus, we just take this moment and we create this space now to just create an altar wherever we are. As we sing this last song, May it be just a moment where we, in our seats, whether that be here or at home, in our living rooms, God, we just take a moment to create an altar where we we bow our hearts to you and we repent and we call out to you and say, oh, Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us. And may we change. May that indifference motivate us to change, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here and if you're, com- if you're able, would you stand with us? We're going to sing one final song, and I'm going to come up and, and uh, conclude our time together. But let's consider which of these areas, or probably all of them, that we need to repent in and see God use us so that we aren't on the receiving end of a woe, but rather a well done. Let's spend some time in worship today.
Let's sing it one more time. Sing it like we believe it. And a miracle can happen now. Come and do it, Lord. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. Evidence is all around. And the Spirit. that I read this week. I, I just make a bunch of notes throughout the week as I study our text. And he, sa- he puts it this way. He says, it is no trivial matter to know so much and not believe. In church, um, one of my great concerns for us in America in general, but also for our church in particular, is that we know a lot. And that is not a trivial thing. We have a responsibility to do something with that, to change, to repent, to become more like Jesus, to be passionate about what he's doing in us, and then allow him to do something through us as well in our action. And so this week, may you go from this place in a spirit of repentance, and may you dwell in that, may you live in that, and allow that to change you into the character of Christ, to change developing a passion for him, and may that change you into acting out and working on his behalf as well. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. I'm so grateful that you came here today. Thanks for joining us online. Uh, Just a couple of things as you are going to be heading out just here in a second. Um, uh, We are in the next couple of weeks. We're trying to figure it out. We got some plans that we're making for kids ministry. So be praying for us as we try to figure out how to do that in the best possible way. Um, we are um, also on Wednesday nights, uh, we are looking at, um, you know, having kind of an uh, in-person uh, worship and prayer time. That prayer meeting is a really important part of the life of our church. So again, in a, a couple weeks, we'll let you know what that looks like. But I um, appreciate you joining us. For those of you that are online, that want to stay online for the time being, we get that. We love you. We're glad that you're, you're there. And we're glad that all of you are here as well. So God bless you. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you on Wednesday online for our worship and prayer time. God bless. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you.